Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's Dr. Peebler. Uh, we're going to continue on this journey. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the last video. I know it was long. It's funny. When I was recording the video, I really had no idea how long it was. I thought it was 10 to 15 minutes, and then I saw that it was 42 minutes. And so just rest assured that the vast, vast majority of the videos are not going to be that long. Um, but I just felt very compelled to get that information out. I think there's a lot of uh, misinformation and misunderstanding about the importance of the sun and how it can improve your life uh, in many different ways. So I hope you enjoy it. It may even take a couple of times to watch it to get through all of it. But uh, needless to say, it's going to set a foundation uh, uh, of where we're going and how uh, the sun affects our health. And the way it affects our health in general is through a process called mitochondrial redox. So in order for us to get to that point, though, talking about mitochondrial redox, what that is, how to affect it, uh, you know, all the nitty gritty uh, regarding that, we need to first dive into what are mitochondria. And uh, I've talked about mitochondria in other videos uh, to some degree, but this is going to be really a, a deep dive. Um, not this video in particular, but just just serious will be uh, a deep dive into mitochondrial function and how they're related to absolutely everything. Uh, I do also want to say that we're going to be looking at mitochondria, uh, or actually what I want to say is we're going to be looking at different uh, modalities of uh, healing and treatment, uh, whether it be a supplement, whether it be food, whether it be a diet, whether it be you know time-restricted eating or, or fasting or the way we exercise. You name it, uh, we're going to be looking at it from a mitochondrial lens. And I don't want to be reductionist, but uh, you know, a lot of the things that we talk about, like for example, exercise has pleiotrophic effects, you know, it has it affects multiple systems. It'll affect your blood sugar, it'll affect your hormones, it'll affect your inflammation, it'll affect your, you know, mitochondrial redox. And in this case, since redox really is the fundamental uh science of, of that of all those things, uh, it's better to start and have that lens. So that's, I just want to give that caveat that as we look at things, you know, I'm going to be, let's say we talk about turmeric or something like that. Turmeric has many things that it does outside of uh, redox, but redox is so fundamental. It will actually affect everything else. And that's kind of how it does it actually. So we're going to start by looking at a graphical representation of a cell. And this graphical representation um, is basically uh, supposed to represent a eukaryotic cell, um, which is an animal, you know, uh, cell. We're, as you can see here, we have uh, a, an outer membrane. Uh, we have a big circle, a purple circle in the middle that represents the nucleus, is where the where the nucleic acids and, and DNA are 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 stored. Um, we have the this outer kind of blue uh, blobs that are that represents the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, both rough and smooth, which uh, the rough is surrounded by these little dots in this picture that are called ribosomes. Then we have the Golgi apparatus, which is kind of the greenish blobs. And then, you know, there's several other uh, what we call organelles uh, involved here. But what we're going to be focusing on is the mitochondria, which is the organelle that rep is represented by the oblong, reddish, orangish um, organelle. All right, so let's zoom in. Let's go into uh, what a mitochondria looks like close up here. So as you can see on the right, um, where you actually have uh, names here instead of instead of acronyms, uh, we're going to look at and see that there are two membranes. There's an inner membrane and an outer membrane. There's a space between the inner and outer membrane called the inner membrane space. Then inside of the inner membrane, we have something called the matrix. And then as you can see, the the inner membrane folds and those folds are called crista, which are exceedingly important to mitochondrial function. So what do mitochondria actually do? I think in general, most people think of mitochondria as the quote unquote power plant of the cell. Uh, it makes energy uh, in the form of ATP via uh, the Krebs cycle, uh, which then moves substrates over to the oxidative phosphorylation or the electron transport chain. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, there are many things that we figured out that the mitochondria actually do. So in addition to oxfos, which is oxidative phosphorylation and energy production, it's also involved in substrate, substrate production, uh, such as neurotransmitters, hormones, uh, nucleic acids that form RNA, DNA, as well as lipids and proteins. And then it's, it's also important for homeostasis for the cell. So iron homeostasis, calcium homeostasis, glucose and lactate homeostasis, 
lipid homeostasis, and then ROS. Uh, and that probably should be ROS or RNS, but that is mitochondrial redox, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. It's also very important for cellular communication, both um, within the cell itself uh, by, by talking to other organelles and the nucleus for gene expression. It's also important for uh, program cell death, such as uh, apoptosis. It can also communicate extracellular to other parts of the body to talk to other systems. This is a complicated diagram, but basically what you see here in the middle is uh, the mitochondria, which is the gray uh, kind of oblong uh, oval. And you see that in the middle of the uh, dark gray oval, you have the Krebs cycle, which we'll get into uh, you know, in depth. Basically is where we take proteins, carbohydrates, and fats and turn that into usable substrates for the electron transport chain, AKA oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, it then makes ATP, which is important for uh, cellular reactions and, and keeping us alive. But then you can also see, you know, outside of the mitochondria, we have glycolysis where we take sugars and convert them into uh, pyruvate. Pyruvate's then used in the Krebs cycle inside the mitochondrial matrix. We have the uh, beta oxidation or fatty acid, uh, you know, breakdown. Uh, and then we have the pentose phosphate pathway, which is going to be helpful for making the ri uh, ribose uh, for the backbones of uh, de novo nucleic acid synthesis. I figured it would be very helpful. So, I mean, I think as you're going to see during this series, I use a lot of pictures. Uh, pictures, I think, you know, they do say a thousand words, and I, and I think I could do a better job of trying to explain things based off of pictures, but this is going to be a video. Uh, there's going to be actually two videos subsequently. One of the videos, I think we can watch the whole video on. It's pretty pretty quick, like less than two minutes. And then the other video, I, I kind of know where to, where I would like to stop. So let's watch the first video, which is going to be just in general, uh, the function of mitochondria. Our body is made up of trillions of cells. They all require energy to function. This energy is created within our cells, in the mitochondria. Here, food is converted into chemical energy called ATP. ATP is released by the mitochondria so cells can use it. Mitochondria consist of two membranes, an outer membrane separating it from the cytosol and an inner membrane surrounding the so-called matrix. The area between these membranes is called the intermembrane space. ATP is generated at the inner membrane of mitochondria by an efficient mechanism called oxidative phosphorylation involving several membrane protein complexes. Nutrients provide high energy electrons in the form of NADH, which are used by the protein complexes to pump protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. This continuous pumping creates a proton gradient where the positively charged protons are attracted to the more negative matrix. When the protons re-enter the matrix through the ATP synthase protein complex, they catalyze the production of ATP. As you can see, pretty short, minute 31. So I think that hopefully uh, helps illustrate some of what we were talking about um, just previously as a kind of a general overview, kind of where it, where it, where it sits in the overall scheme of things within a cell, uh, in general, like the process of oxidative phosphorylation. And this is another video. This is put on by Harvard a couple, uh, several years ago. It's a really neat graphical re representation uh, of what we're going to be talking about in the next several slides, um, kind of in more detail. But this is just a good uh, graphical, you know, video way of helping us understand what we're about to talk to talk about in the next couple of slides. All eukaryotic cells, from yeast to those that make up the human body, contain membrane-bound organelles with specialized functions. Mitochondria are double-membraned organelles that harness most of the energy that cells need to grow and reproduce. Nearly all of this energy comes from reactions that take place at the inner mitochondrial membrane. One of the key roles of this membrane is to act as a barrier to positively charged particles called protons, thus allowing a concentration gradient to be maintained where the intermembrane space has far more protons than the matrix. 
The membrane also contains a large protein complex called F1, F0 ATP synthase, which uses the proton gradient to drive the synthesis of ATP molecules. These ATP molecules ultimately provide the energy for most of the cell's reactions. Just as man-made power plants produce electrical energy by using the flow of wind, water, or steam to rotate a turbine, the synthase makes ATP by using proton flow from one side of the inner membrane to the other to rotate protein subunits. If there is no proton gradient, synthase subunits stop rotating, and the cell can quickly become starved of energy and die. Therefore, the protein complexes and small molecules that establish this gradient and maintain it play an essential role in the life of the cell. At the heart of this system are four protein complexes, numbered one through four. Complexes one, three, and four directly pump protons from the matrix into the intermembrane space. Complex two does not directly pump protons, but it does promote proton pumping in complexes three and four. Proton pumping requires energy, and the four protein complexes get this energy by transferring electrons through a series of coupled reactions. This linked process of electron transport is why the four complexes are collectively referred to as the electron transport chain. Okay, so I hope you're still with me here. Um, I know this is, uh, you know, pretty scientific for most of you all. Uh, I hope you, you know, if you really want to learn, you know, about this, uh, I, I want to teach you. So as as I talked about in both videos, essentially, on the side where there's the matrix, you have less protons, and on the inner membrane space, you have more protons, and that is actually actively pumped. So this is exactly why we eat, okay? So we eat proteins, carbohydrates, and fats in order to make two chemicals, NADH and FADH2. And as you can see here, both of those uh, are going to donate electrons to the electron transport chain, which is going to basically empower these pumps to actually pump protons into the, the inner membrane space so that we can build up a, a concentration. And then just like it's like damming up a, 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 a lake or, or, or a river, you're going to create a, a potential energy with all those protons. They're going to fall down the gradient through the ATP synthase. It's going to then be able to create ATP. Um, this is just another picture uh, how basically we donate you know, NAD becomes NADH becomes NAD, FADH2 becomes FAD after it donates its protons and electrons. And you can see the, the, the flow of electrons through the system. And ultimately you end up with water. And then uh, as you can see on the, on the far right side, we, we, we basically convert an ADP, adenosine diphosphate with a phosphate molecule. And the, the synthase will, will rotate and create ATP, which is our usable energy in the system. Uh, another you know, basically another uh, graphical representation. And before I explain why I put this slide in here, I want to mention that, as you can see in all of these diagrams, even the one from Harvard, all of these proteins, these complex one, two, three, four, cytochrome C, uh, CoQ, et cetera, the, the, uh, the, uh, the ATP synthase, they're all very spread apart. And that's, the, you know, when I, when I went through, I, I'm, my undergraduates in biochemistry and then and then in medical school we learned a lot of biochemistry and when i went through this through through school this is exactly how i learned it i i learned it as if there are these there's these big complexes um they are very far apart the electrons just kind of magically find the the place where they're supposed to find and you know we make atp now the reason i'm showing this particular slide is because you can see under complex four, you see it like a like a non-smoking sign or a, a do not enter sign. Like that is that means the complex is broken because cyanide has attached itself to complex four. So for the most part, everybody knows that cyanide kills people. 
And the way cyanide kills people is that it actually just stops one chemical reaction, this complex four within the mitochondrial inner membrane in the oxidative phosphorylation or electron transport chain. And it stops your body from being able to make ATP and therefore it shuts down and then we can't make ATP and the person, you know, dies. So what this is, and this is, this is, I think this is probably the least, the by far least important part of the talk is that this is what kind of like, uh, what, uh, these proteins look like uh, in real life versus the you know blobs that you put in diagrams just to make the points. They're made of above many proteins, many different subunits. Um, so this is a picture of complex one, two, three, four, as well as the ATPase, and uh, in a, in a in a way of looking at these ribbon format of these proteins. And then these molecules actually come together to form you know these multiple subunit co you know uh, complexes. So as you can see, there's I don't exactly know how many units, you know, subunits are in this protein of complex one, but you can see there's many different parts and all those require different genes and different, you know, uh, transcription to, 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 to create that, uh, complex. And that complex has to come together, uh, perfectly or else it will, it will, it will cause problems. And we're going to talk about that later when we talk about mitochondrial heteroplasmy. Uh, this is a picture of complex two, how it comes together. It seems to be, you know, it's much more, uh, simple in terms of the structure compared to complex one, uh, com and then we have CoQ, uh, or CoQ10 as, as it's, as it's, uh, uh, colloquial known and kind of in the supplement, uh, literature, but this is, you see how it's, it's in the middle of everything, you know, uh, and, and many different molecules work through CoQ. Um, and we'll talk about CoQ, uh, in, in detail later on, but this is just a general overview of CoQ, how it's formed, uh, through, uh, you know, biosynthesis of, of CoQ. And then we have complex three, how different proteins and, and heme molecules come together to form complex three. And then later we have complex four, uh, and then we have the ATPase, which again is multiple subunits. It's a large complex, and 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 so this is just the 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 general overview of what a mitochondria is, how it uh, you know makes ATP or or usable cellular energy from food, uh, and then in addition, it has a lot of other jobs. And I, I I put this in here because you know I think that when I was going through school, um, you know, in the early two thousands. I was kind of in school at the peak of when, you know, medicine was looking at the, the human genome, right, and, and the nucleus and DNA. And as you can see, since 1980, you know, the the interest in, in, in publications for mitochondria have just, you know, continued to rise and rise. And I think that we're just still seeing the tip of the iceberg and seeing how important it is to medicine. Uh, and I hope that you uh, stick with me as we go through this journey and on how mitochondria uh, are involved in, in literally every disease process. And uh, the next uh, topic will be about mitochondrial heteroplasmy. So I hope you stick with me. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, please leave them in the and and on the video and comment. Uh, if you like it, like it. If you if you want to see more content like this, you know, subscribe and help us out. Um, I really want to tell this story to help you understand how to take care of yourself and uh, those you care about.